Hello and welcome to Some Sort of Talk Show. I am Tyler and this is, and joined with me today is Evan. Aww. Is he there still? <laughs> Aww. Sad I can hear you. You can hear me. Yeah. Okay. So say hi. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Again. There we Internet. go. Um, and today we're continuing our trek to um, create our way through the D and D monster um, index. I guess I can't really say the monster manual because then we'd probably be in the bees already. I don't actually have don't the physical know. book Maybe. with me right now. <laughs> but yeah so anyways so today's monster or so yesterday we did um the alakith which i don't know i've only learned about that you know this month no last month this month i don't know what day it is right now <laughs> um so the alakith pretty early so maybe last the alakith was this um passageway sort of inhabiting fungal demon creature that if you left it alone too long would eventually um convert your your passageway into a portal into its own sort of horrendous area and allow other things to walk through it um and today continuing down the alphabetical line we have the ellip a L L I P. Um, according to D and D Beyond, um, when a mind uncovers a secret that a powerful being has protected with a mighty curse, the result is often the emergence of an alip. Secrets protected in this manner range in scope from a demon lord's true name to the hidden truths of the cosmic order. The alip acquires the secret, but the curse annihilates his body and leaves behind a spectral creature composed of fragments from the victim's psyche in overwhelming psychic agony. That last sentence actually confuses me a lot. So it starts off as a physical creature and then moves into a spectral spectral creature or it is the result of a physical creature learning that secret it's the result of a physical creature learning the the secret and being like torn apart and be into a spectral creature although i did a little bit of research to see if there was any other <clears throat> versions of what the ellip is and in 3.5 edition it had like it was just the tormented soul of a person that was tormented in life uh, until they committed suicide. And so they're vengeful and just want revenge on the people that tormented them. And I did notice, like, there was, like, a little thing that was, like, making reference to somebody that was an ellip or became an ellip. And their, their mind or psyche became the ellip, but their body was turned into a right. So... Oh, I don't know. There were some big changes between 3.5 and 5th uh, <laughs> edition version of what the ellip is and what its motivations are. That that would be a lot more concise. <laughs> or that would be a lot more efficient of resources. So it's like it's not just the destruction of one thing is the creation of another. It's like the destruction of one thing actually spawns two things that you have to deal with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just like i don't know it's a weird thing uh i think which I, I don't i don't do ghost um stories very much whenever i play um but there's this like often idea of like you have to bury their bones or destroy their bones or stuff like in some things or like the, the thing that's gone wrong is the spirit or sometimes they have it the reverse or it's like the body is like some has become some horrible monster and the spirit really wants it to like just go to sleep and die. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it'd be really frustrating to like set the precedent of playing that a couple of times and like dealing with either the body or the spirit. And like one time dealing with having to deal with the ellip that's trying to drive you mad because it's angry. And then having to deal with its body that's just now undead nasty. 
and Lenchy. I don't know. That's usually what they are. <laughs> so today, what are you going to try to um, surmount in your artistic endeavor really? of the Alip? I don't know. I like it's there was the drawing of it could be a big old blob thing of like sweepy lines and stuff and trying to like control what still feels like human and what feels like shreds of these like um, dark tortured uh, psyche fragments. But what really drew to me was the creation of the lip. So I think I want to do something where like somebody stumbles in um, kind of like breaks down a little bit uh, and then has that moment where they they like fall back and like thing pops out of their chest yes. and is now that's exactly yuck, what you're, that's thing. exactly what your build up like um was depicted as in my mind i was just like yes cicada <laughs> cicada that <laughs> asshole. Uh, that's a nasty sentence um <laughs> um but like cicada was just the easiest way to describe what was actually in my mind like in my mind, it was like a more spectral ver. If you can somehow imagine a more spectral version of like a, like instead of a like a, like a basic werewolf transition, like the more violent version of a werewolf transition, where they just start ripping off pieces of like their human portion. Yeah, that was. Ugh. <laughs> Which one did that recently? So the most was... recent version of that one that I really liked was a small chapter in Love, Death, and Robots. Mm, that's true. That was a good one. And they also I was thinking... did the regeneration factor very subtly, and it was mm. interesting how their take on it. Yeah, I was... That was a good. If you guys haven't seen uh, Love Death Robots, go watch it. It's fun. It's kind of weird. Like I don't know what the, the like their standards were of what they had to do to make stuff, but I feel like one of the things was like you must have some nudity. So there's always <laughs> like a random scene, whether it makes sense or not, of nudity in there. But it's generally uh, a collection of really cool animations. Actually, I don't know if there was any that I didn't like. Hmm. I don't hmm. know. Really, I think that like uh, the examples of killing Hitler was probably the most fun one <laughs> out of all of them. And that was like, I don't know, uh, less visually like, um, I don't know, technical than a lot of the other things. But the storyline wise, really fun, really fun. Let me just throw up the... Oh, I have to save it to my friggin' computer. Hold on. I'll just throw out uh, the image of D&D's version of an ellip so that I can show people, like, the target goal. <laughs> I need to remember to do that every once in a while. Um, So how... Well... Do my set. I'll do this image setup real quick, and then I'll let you work. And by explaining how I got to where I was in my version of the project, and then we'll see where we go from there. Uh, if you want a mental exercise, what I'm going to do after I'm done explaining how I got to where I am in my project, um. I'm trying to think of examples of how I would use the ellip in like a story or something. So if you mm. have a version, then I shall ask you about it. But if you do not, then you will not. I don't know. I was kind of thinking that there was some cool stuff that was said in the um fifth edition version of it of it was like really stumpy legs on this little man but it's just a sketch um of that part of their like eternal torture of being uh, annoyed by or 
in pain by the curse that's tearing that's tearing them apart is that they can bestow their knowledge as fragmented and crazy as it is onto other creatures and it tries it in a variety of ways like one by like it's like uh the psychic madness in like a combat scenario and just like touching things and making those things kind of go mad and feel its pain and know its secrets or by secretly getting people to write down all the knowledge that it learned Mm -hmm. which is an interesting an interesting idea so really i don't think i'd want to use the ellipse as it is because it doesn't seem like it just wants to fight it seems like one of those things where it's just like oh man uh there's this guy working on a working on a story and he's being really weird or working on his thesis and he's been acting weird and like progressively he's getting crazier and crazier and other people in the area have been like um i don't know uh coming down uh with illnesses and sores and madness and like all talking about very similar things and part of like your whole thing is really maybe to destroy the Aleph, maybe to get the person to like finish his thesis, but to ultimately stop the spread of this crazy. And then to lock up this book. So nobody reads the book and goes, Oh, that's cool. And then like it explodes into an Aleph. And it, <laughs> the whole thing starts over again. So then I don't know from a third 3.5 edition one. Uh, it's a, I think I've seen this like, uh, and like supernatural, I want to say, was like the show that like uh, our mutual friend David tried to get us to watch or get me to watch a bunch. Um, and it was like a, it's that kind of thing where you're trying to solve, um, stop the mur- this murderous ghost, but you find out that the ghost is murderous because it really was some poor person that was driven to suicide. And so everybody that this ghost is trying to kill kind of fucking deserves it. <laughs> And so then you have that weird decision of like, how, how do we put down this ghost thing? Um, and maybe if you like cross contaminate, like the, the idea of how it's spreading the psychic power damage around, like the heroes have to endure all of its pain and suffering um, that, uh, that it wants to bestow upon like all these other people. And hopefully they survive because of sheer real will of being a hero. <laughs> I don't know. That's a weird one. Then you just have to live on knowing that you just saved a bunch of people that definitely did not deserve it. Probably. I I I care. I know I know a bit about supernatural just from vicariously listening about it through like three people that I know. And mm-hmm. Yeah, they got other they got other things in their back po- in, you know in their in their corners backing them up as to being like this is why you survive these encounters. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. It's interesting mm-hmm. that David would latch on to that. Actually, I wouldn't think that that would be his cup of tea, as it were. <laughs> no, it is a little bit. Um, it's a little strange uh, sometimes, but I think. I think why he did is because he does like action and little bits of fantasy. Usually he puts his like enjoyment of fantasy um, into uh, like this like Chinese movies. Mm. Um, but he does kind of like it. And so what I think he latched onto, it's his like redneck uh, <laughs> like side of him. And he really liked, Dean, I want to say his name was. Yeah. And like the fact that he was a big manly man. And he was a big manly man that just kills monsters and drives a really cool old car that he takes care of. <laughs> Doesn't believe in iPads because real men have cassettes. <laughs> so That's why I think he liked that. David that is such a him. David is such a squire. Like if if ever we were in like a fantasy setting if there was ever like like the league of legends like garen type person that existed in like his village or his town or something he would do mm-hmm. everything in his power to try to 
work next to that individual and just be like, yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I don't know. I guess we all have our idea of what's a hero or a manly man or all that. And that's that's what, what David latches on to. And, and I think it's weird. I think a lot of people like try to find that character that they identify with most in a show or movie. And that will make you like the movie if you can see yourself or identify with a character. And for him, sometimes it's like, mm, like if he plays ACDC and has a cool car, then I'm going to watch this movie. <laughs> or if it's Adam Sandler, because I don't know why he likes Adam Sandler, but he does. Uh, I mean, to be fair, I find Adam Sandler's content funny, but then I need to take like a month break just to let the jokes kind of reset. Cause hmm. even though the, the, like the movies, for example, even though they're they're like the, the stories may be different the theme of the jokes are very are very similar <laughs> you know so if you if you've seen one adam sandler movie you kind of know what jokes are going to be in that film mm -hmm. but you know if you if you let it if you let it reset in your mind then when you see that next one you're like ha ha that was that was clever and funny <laughs> but if you watch them like back to back to back in like a marathon you're just like oh okay he did <sighs> he did that joke again, <laughs> but just with different names. Yeah. Um, where are you? Your Discord share. Okay, there you are. I'm doing it, Peter. All right, there we go. So now I need to add, the only thing I want to do is add text underneath this thing as far as like this is the target. And then I can start talking about stuff. <laughs> okay. Boom. Yeah. All right. I wonder if that's too small. Oh well. <clears throat> black on black on black. Yeah, well, it's hard to. I didn't know that D and D Beyond had. I mean, it made sense because they're like, oh, you could just take this and throw it into your, you know, digital digital board game thing, you know, so it has the transparency on it. I did not mm. know that. <laughs> I didn't know it had a transparency on it. So I was just like, uh, That's kind of cool. I guess I could make your Discord window larger and stick it in the, like, the tan area. You could. But how are you going to show off the wiggling on yours? Well, I'm just going to go through mine real quick, and then I'm just going to full screen, or not full screen, but I'm going to show yours in a larger scale. But I gotta find your thing first. All right, there it is. All right. So let's let me discuss how I got here first, and then we can focus on the process of how you're getting to where you are. Um. So I needed to create this. So I had to create this kind of spectral character, and there's a couple. You know, there's a couple routes that I could take to get here. The first one is to just create a shape and then just sculpt the crap out of it to try to give it more of like a wispy kind of cloud looking doodad. And then give it like a transparency body. And But the problem with that, the reason why I didn't go for that immediately was because... Um, the way I do that kind of stuff is it could easily be misrepresented as like a blob creature with eyes. And I was mm -hmm. like, nah, I'm not going to do that one. So the first thing that I tried to attempt was um, a smoke simulation. So 
you know, why not just go straight to the source? And Blender has some really good simulation um, programs in here. And so if we're doing if we're doing ghosts, you know, the closest thing that hu a human can really kind of um, relate that image to to another human is oh it was, it was like this it was like this smoky you know like it was like this smoky kind of you know image um if you can imagine the word ghost and specter not existing in our vocabulary at all um it was like a light but it's harder to model light <laughs> in blender so smoke is the next best thing um but so if for anyone who's actually done anything in blender um smoke simulation doesn't have a lot of manipulative tools after you've simulated the thing you can you can direct its you can dictate its direction you can throw force fields in there to try to disperse some of it or um, wind tunnels to try to shove portions of it you know to a different direction but all those things were very finicky and it didn't really it didn't yield good results um so i scrapped that image and i said all right so the next the next thing that i've seen other game developers use for their ghostly entities and spectral figures is um hair hair basically <laughs> um or at least what looks what ends up being a hair simulation in Blender. They might use other things for their video games, but in Blender, it's a hair simulation. Um, I was tempted to use just a normal particle simulation and just make the particle look like something else, but it's hard to not make it look like snow or rain. So uh, I didn't know how well that would go around to be like, yeah, this is totally a ghost, this raining dripping looking thing so went with hair all right so um there's a couple of things you can do with a hair simulation you can just kind of let it go and it'll just kind of be this puff ball and you can um you can go into from object mode you can go if you select your actual hair the thing your hair is simulating off of you can go into the particle edit and you can actually like, you know, use the comb, you can use the comb tool to actually like move these things into a basic general direction, um, which is what I ended up doing. Uh, and just hard, <laughs> um, try to hard sculpt your hair to where you want it to go. But then when you get into the ideas of like the individual strands and like the chaos that I kind of wanted to give it more of that like kind of spectral look um using the comb tool by itself wasn't going to cut it so what i ended up doing was um just kind of combing down in general everything just to kind of uh umbrella downward i guess is the best way i can describe that and then i added some hair dynamics which is kind of um, emphasizes the physics that exists um, for the hair particles, which um, gives it more gravity. So everything sort of falls down so that it doesn't just hang in this sort of bowl cut position that you combed it into. Mm -hmm. And then um, from there, I added two force fields. Uh, the first one being a vortex to a attempt to try to give it more of like a swirly sort of just to mess it up you know just to just to ruffle up the ruffle up the hair as it were um, plus i thought that i could eliminate the collisions so that the hairs could go through each other but i found that to be a lot more in depth than i had time for the second force field that I added is a turbulence force field, just to further give more chaos to each strand. And then um, I messed with things like the flow, the strength, the size of the turb, you know, the size of the area that the turbulence affects and stuff like that. Um, I used to have a 
a wind simulation, like blowing down just to give it, you know, just to keep the hair strands from flowing outward more and to give it more of that like traditional ghost dress kind of sheet looking kind of thing. But it ended up cancel the the combination of data that I had for those for those force fields. Um, it ended up looking like it was canceling out either one or the other of my f other force fields. So I just eliminated the wind altogether. Mm. And I turned off or I turned down the gravity. Yeah, I turned down the gravity all the way. So it starts at one. So one is maximum. So I turned it all the way down to 0.153 just to kind of hopefully give it more of a floaty effect. And I ended up with this out of crossing my fingers and some luck. So, um, yeah, it starts off kind of weird and then everything sort of settles as the gravity effects kind of take place or what little gravity effects take place. Turbulence makes everything just messes up everything in between. And uh, I decided to add the eyes just to give it more of a living, uh, not a living effect, but more of a, I'll, I'll say a living agency. <laughs> so it's not exactly mm. alive, but just to give it more of that, you know, person. And then the starting scene that you usually are given in Blender gives you a cube, a light, and a camera. The cube I deleted because it's really hard, or it's not worth the effort to make a cube into the sphere that I needed for this. And then I just moved the, the, the light from kind of off-center to dead center, and then just right underneath the source of where the hairs are coming out of to give it that sort of ethereal glow so that's literally a light in there not a texture and then finally for the eyes i gave it a red base and i gave it an emission so that it would hopefully kind of glow in the dark a little more and i don't know it, it came out came out all right i think it it it's it doesn't have the arms that I thought it would have, but um, I think for like a super low budget, like thirteen, maybe like a like a two dollar, like a two dollar Steam horror game or something, I'd really hate this thing to come charging at me down a hall, down a dark hallway, you know. <laughs> so uh yeah that's my no, it's not it's terrible. not it's not as humanoid as i want it but that's my that's my ellip <laughs> that's my that's my creation of uh from a from a dark secret um let me see what it looks like if i turn the world color down so if i just make it dark <laughs> you kind of lose the ends you kind of lose the ends of the hair but i don't know if that looks better what do you think Mm, I think it, I don't know, it has its own kind of creepy vibe, but I think the, <laughs> the, the movement that's, that's felt at the edges is kind of nice. Yeah. All right. So let me move the camera actually. And then ah, I don't really care about the camera actually. So anyways, Sadly. so that's my, that's my quick one hour and 40 minute attempt at trying to create an ellip in Blender or some sort of representation of an ellip in Blender. Let's check back on Even and see what his spiel is. So that's, so in the center of the screen right here, this is D&D &D Beyond's representation of an ellip. And that was our target. Now let me turn even back on and see where he's at. Boom. <laughs> Mine has like nothing all that much right now. Little parts. Little parts. Um, just doodling where things are at kind of. But if it, uh, um, I kind of just broke it up into its sections a little. But 
that it's walking stage, which I think should move at a rate of four seconds. And then in two seconds, it should kneel and like crouch. And then the last four seconds is it exploding into the like creature. <laughs> I'm just kind of subdividing things quick, uh, kind of quickly. And I think, I think two seconds is good. I want to say three seconds, the body should be like this, but most of like uh, burning should be happening. And then like the creature should be coming out. And unfortunately, I want to say that all of this is too high. There's not enough room. I like gotta move things down. <laughs> I'm stealing some of your some of your workspace for our target. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no worries. Hmm, that's weird. Should that not? I guess that's not all that important. But I don't know. Doodling. It's been a while since I've animated anything. So there's like a lot of things that I'm like, uh, I don't remember if that works well like that. But So what what, what program of... are you using? This is... Photoshop. Photoshop? Mm-hmm. Are those... Are those boxes each like 30 keyframes or something? Or... It's very unfamiliar no. to me what I'm looking at. Yeah, and this is like a little different from what I grew up with. Um, but overall, um, you can set how many frames there are. I don't know. Can you? Oh, well, that doesn't seem. Um, near the bottom, each of these like frames, I can. This is just how long the layer will last for the visibility, and you can kind of see I'm moving them around because right now on my little bar of what is visible at three seconds. You can see there's like a little marker there, uh, three seconds. There is the explosion frame and the walking frame. But I could move the explosion frame out and the crouching flame, frame there. Or I could move them so that they don't intersect. So as the bar goes through, it'll only show one layer at a time. You can see those kind of like coming in and out. Uh, so I can set how many frames or uh, happen. Uh, currently at the bottom, it looks like I have this set to 30 frames per second. So for every increment of like the the two second or the second markings um, is should be 30 frames. But there's not. I don't have it set to where I'm working frame by frame. I can dictate how long I want that layer to last, and the computer just finds out how many frames that is. All right. I'm just uh, breaking up. I don't know. Right now, the way that I like to work for animation is called um, uh, um, I guess keyframing uh, is the idea. And so my keyframes, uh, I draw as a layer. And you can see on my walk layer, um, I have a whole lot that I'm breaking up. But originally, it started out as just the the first first stance or where it ends up. And then I just started dividing up, you know, where I want every position to be. And I will keep on subdividing until I get everything in the position that it is uh, or should be along that, that tract of time. And then um, I guess I started with the crouch. So that was one keyframe. And then the other between crouch and uh, the uh, standing. I'm going to probably create a new layer and then draw a couple of drawings in between between those because I want uh, because it's easy for me to tell you know where did it start where did it end and then I'm just figuring out where things go in the middle section so it's a big thing a small thing sort of thing uh, I'm thinking about the ends of things not so much as like a like a, B, C, D sort of drawing, which I feel like, I don't know, some of yours have like certain properties of that A, B, C, but I think that works really well for effects. I think most animator, animators, which they call this uh, straight ahead animation because it goes chronologically, say that like when you're drawing effects, it's a really good idea to, to go straight ahead because you just don't know where it's going to move. So A starts to move to B and then B moves to C and then C moves to... Uh, D and you kind of like find out like oh that's the wiggle path 
because it's sometimes, especially in like smoky things, and we'll kind of see if I get to that part where that ends up. Um, it's hard to anticipate where smoke has been um, based on what, to where it is, since it kind of just wiggles around with the wind. <laughs> Sorry, I'm adding a hallway to my scene because I'm trying to figure out how to frame this guy so it's creepy, but you can also see <laughs> you can also see hmm. detail. That is so hard. Dag nyabit. Maybe I need to add a sun? I don't want to add a sun, though. <laughs> Is that why I want things? Um, Hard to say. Hard to say. <laughs> so what would your scenarios of trying to use an elliptic in your game be? Um, hold on. I think I'm getting close, but not quite there yet. Um, it's kind of creepy. Let's bring down the light. Let's see, so. Mm. Yeah, I don't know how to make that creepier. Um, okay, so let's see. Let's remind ourselves. An elip might attempt to share its lore to escape its curse and enter the afterlife. It can transfer knowledge from its mind by guiding another creature to write down what it knows. So it's it's the it, it's it's having the information right that both killed it and made it trapped in the sort of in between. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I think I would start with. The players meeting in like a reoccurring like tertiary character, maybe like a like a twenty three year old like you know bookworm researcher person, kind of like the um, the anthropologist in um, the last the last Avatar. Okay. And, you know, he finally, he, he finally finds, like, a selection of books, starts reading through them, and then, like, the third one, like, you know, the player, the players could be somewhere else or something, and all they hear is, like, a scream or something. <coughs> and, is this thing invisible? <laughs> can move through creatures and objects as if they were difficult terrain. It takes damage if it ends inside an object? Mm -hmm. What the heck kind of a... Oh, so it's not like a ghost, but it is still undead. That's weird. No, actually, all ghosts have that same sort of What? I thought feature. they just... Yeah. I, thought, I thought ghosts were special because they kind of are... They can be seen on the material plane, but they exist on the ethereal. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but if they take this, the the space, or if they exist in the same space that something else exists, like a uh, like a table or chair or a person, then it takes damage, because technically the ethereal, like I don't know, it's like the ethereal plane also has those same tables, chairs, and stuff, hmm. or uh -huh. that intersection of the ethereal and the um, a material plane existing things still can't necessarily 
occupy the same space for very long. Mm. Um, I think what I want to okay. So what I what I continued with in my head was so this poor this poor individual becomes a poor soul and he just kind of exists there um but the process of learning what he learned also kind of unlocked the pathway for that very entity to come in so in a sense he both learned who's coming through this portal and also opened the portal um so and by doing so he also kind of trapped himself in a prison so he can't share that information um because then that entity comes through and now the everyone's like oh god and then he'll like either trap or just like make the ellip version of this poor individual just you know go away like he'll just punt him somewhere else <laughs> um, <laughs> And now these now the player characters have to like run. It, it's hard to write running scenarios because usually when you play D and D, everyone's like, "Oh yeah, like we can totally take on this challenge and just get team wiped." Um, but narratively, that would usually be a running scenario. So they see this, you know, this demon lord or something. This high you know this high class demon general or something come through this portal this book portal you know look at the look at the ellip and just be like you idiot and just like flick him into a wall or something or into a painting or something you know into another dimension mm. and then look at the player characters and be like you know oh look there's still some fleshies in this room and so I guess the player characters could take some damage and just be like, we can't deal with this and then start running through the library or something. Um, then much later. So now, you know, now there's this thing on the loose and they can learn how to reseal it from the one person who actually read the book and is now in a lip, just kind of wandering around, you know, kind of, kind of clueless about like you know what's going on why why is everyone ignoring me or running away from me um mm. so then you can go into the so then there's so there would be three three routes that i would explore in writing like in the in the draft of this story in which there would be route number one which is um, the demon lord coming through and then trapping the ellip in a painting and then you go into the same sort of scenario that um, Oblivion, you know, um, Elder Scrolls Oblivion had that I really liked in which, you know, now the now the players have to find the painting that the ellip currently exists in because it could be a very Looney Tunes thing where the ellip, you know, is just drifting through different paintings uh, you know like one once every week he finds a way into a different painting or something so they mm. have to find the painting they have to try to find a way into the painting you know and like isolate the ellip and be like all right just you know give us hints or you know do charades or something and like we'll we'll write down what's going on and then you can pass on and we can trap this demon type of a thing you know mm. Um, the other scenario is, what was the other scenario? Um, the other scenario is he is the ellip is now kind of is now drifting around in this limbo type area. I guess it can still exist on this plane though, right? Like it's not, it's not like a ghost, right? Where it can go in between the ethereal and the material. It's just wherever it doesn't say wherever yeah. that person died like that's where the ellip exists um mm -hmm. okay so for this for this pathway to exist the library would have to be in the realm that the demon lord's castle would be or something you know so um because in this one it's kind of like um it's kind of like a three shell game in which it's this 
it's this great, you know, it's this, it's this ballroom, you know, and all these, all of these ellipses, just this mass collection of ellipses are just kind of drifting around and existing in this, you know, in this never ending festival party type thing. Um, racked with the pain of their secrets, but, you know, the farce is this, you know, the farce is this party. And the player characters have to try to go through and try to find which ellip was theirs, <laughs> you know, which one was the one that they need. So they have to try to, they have to try to listen to each ellipse story and be like, is that similar? Is that totally different? You know, and then it's kind of, it goes into this like more detective type scenario. Hmm. Um, and then in saying those two scenarios, I forgot what the premise was for the third that gave me inspiration for the third one. But there is a third path that I would tinker around with in the editing room. Um, but yeah, then once they have, you know, then once they have the ellip and its information, you know, then the ellip can, you know, be free to disperse its, you know, disperse and pass on. And now the players have this, you know, have this kernel of information that they can now go and be like, all right, cool. So now we need to find the lantern or something and we can retrap this, you know, we can retrap this dude or we can spend, you know, a year in real time, just level up our characters to like level 13 or something and then just try our best at killing this demon. Or they could find a lantern, roll higher than a 15, and just trap the thing. So, <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, those would be the only, like, because that would be, like, the full, the full version of using an ellip in my head. Because otherwise, the only other way that I would use an ellip is if a wizard or something told the party that they could get a hint as to where this temple or something is from a researcher that he knows named fill in fantasy name, you know, <laughs> and then they go fantasy. to, they go to that dude's hut or cottage or house or whatever, you know, and they find out that the guy's dead. Um, there's nothing but like a desiccated corpse. Cause he's been dead for quite some time now. Turns out he's now in a lip. You know, and then they can go and try to find the ellip and try to get the information. You know, so it's just kind of a tutor to from point A to point B type of a thing. You know, it's like he has this information, he has his password, and we need to find this guy to give us the password. The fact that mm. he's neutral evil, though, makes me think that he wouldn't he wouldn't like the ellip wouldn't outright attack the player characters but he'd maybe want something in return or um like a i don't know what what blood sacrifice is that chaotic evil or is that lawful <laughs> uh i don't know like a i've never really enjoyed the alignment system maybe okay so let me see every lip is wrecked with a horrifying insight creature can impart um the let me see so neutral evil so he would trade that information for hmm <laughs> What stops the ellip from what stops the ellip from just like transferring its information to other people and just like creating a zombie apocalypse scenario but with spectral ellipse? Are they not allowed to share the information that they know? I think they do. Uh, I don't know as far as I was reading, but that if we're if we're going with like the 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 fifth edition version of things i think oh that they, sorry there they is. tell like partial bits of their information yeah and like probably the most the best way would be to get it fully told to one person but that would free them and then that person would become on the, on the list so everyone could know one by one but then they die immediately <laughs> um, 
or they write it down into a book and that book gets put somewhere else or the person ha doesn't really can't make out what it said like uh, did you watch what was that thing uh penny dreadful no that doesn't even sound familiar to me cool uh <laughs> it's an, another neat fantasy thing but they're try they find this like old prophecy uh written down by some mad monk but the mad monk wrote the down the prophecy on anything he could find like a shoe uh like pieces of wall their clothes like it was just like bits and pieces and it was in like like five different languages <laughs> like it would just switch back and forth so maybe the ellipse is whispering in its mad incoherent way to a person driving that person mad and that person is recording everything but does so in an incomplete puzzle sort of fashion. So, like, I don't know. It's like if you went about your house and every day you found a different puzzle piece, but you didn't really, like, know what to do with them, so you just put them all into a box, you would have the complete knowledge of said demon lord's name, but you wouldn't, you would, since you didn't read it in order, you have no clue what you have. So it waits for somebody to do research or some really crazy puzzle person to be like, Oh, I'll put this all together. Oh, look, it's, ah! and then you become a North. So the other, the other way, the other way that I could see in using it into a story is, um, it's, it's kind of like the quest hub creature, you know? So the characters have to find this old scholar or something who's now currently in a lip and an lip um to find you know to find the door to something or to find you know the ex machina for some other thing um but because he can only impart portions of it um the the person that tells them that they need to find this ellipse warns them that he can only you know he can only give you bits and portions of it at a time and so but if you learn all of it you're going to turn into the same thing that he is so be warned that i don't know if he'll give it to you in two parts if he'll give it to you in three parts you know so it's kind of like it's kind of like playing 21 you know it's like how many pieces of information can you get before you either get enough you know you feel safe enough that you can continue on and not be um, not have too little information and die as a result of that or get too much information and turn into an ellip. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that, I, I think that'd be a really cool, um, interaction of just being like, all right, so do we only get two pieces of information out of it and see if we turn into an ellip or do we only get, do we try to just ask it for the one shard of information and see if we can work off of that? But I think that'd be really cool if, like, you designed that that interaction to be, like, the first shard that they get is almost as unhelpful as, like, go west and find a rock. And what you seek... Go west, find a rock, and what you seek is north. It's like, uh, Jesus. <laughs> okay. Um... You know, so then, you know, so that would be, oh, so that would be the evil, that would be the evil portions of the ellip kind of coming out and just like, you know, keep feeding them little bits and pieces of it that are still relatively like not very helpful or, you know, it's like splotchy. So like if someone, if so, if it just happens to click, then it's like, all right, we don't need any from information. Let's get away from this guy. But the ellip keeps trying to be like, come on. I'm going to give you that last information next time and you're going to be, you're going to be me. You're going to, you're going to be one of us. One of us. <laughs> Damn. Now I want to write that. I want to write that scenario down. Cause I think the hardest part about that, about that chapter in your, like in your D and D adventure would be writing down the way the clues are said that the ellip would give, you know, writing down how the shards are said so that they're vague enough so that they 
do eventually add up to the full picture, but they are vague enough that the players have to kind of come back for another, you know, for another clue, for another clue. But obviously you should write like the last three shards or the last two shards or however many you want to give so that there is the possibility for it to click for at least like one or two of your players. Because that would just be mean if you just wrote it so that it's just like only a chess master would be able to piece these things together. <laughs> <laughs> You got a story ahead of you, mate. I know. And this thing's only a challenge rating five, and that's such a pivotal that's such a pivotal NPC <laughs> such a pivotal NPC thing. Um, well, it's I don't know, it's weird how many NPCs you meet that are actually really pathetic. Like so so often you're taking orders from NPCs that are uh, that are like nobles because they own land and prestige and people that you like don't feel like murdering because and that's what a cr one ape that shouldn't be that bad in um in D and D online, it was just really funny to me. Now that you say that, that one of the, one of the more, not really a pivotal character, but one of the one of the, one of the NPCs that kind of holds more power over the player, just because you have to go up to him and like, um, pay him like the more expensive type of currency, which is like the diamonds or something. I don't remember what they're called some sort of a crystal and it's a cobalt astral shards <laughs> probably hmm. astral shards but it's a cobalt <laughs> it's just like why do i have why why should i give a crap about like why should i give you any respect to pay you this you know not just normal gold and platinum <laughs> you know but it's like no i mean you you give you give me or the master will be really angry <laughs> Mm -hmm. or the you know entirely reasonable like or what you're just gonna kill me in public you psychopath <laughs> <laughs> that's also true do, 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 do. man it has been a while <laughs> since I've worked in this kind of program but it's not Horrible. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> What's happening in yours? Ah, uh, that's disgusting with all the things that are happening on the walls. <laughs> yeah, I just added. I just added a hallway type thing, and I don't know. I don't know how to give. I don't know how to give. Um, procedural darkness <laughs> usually usually what the struggle is with blender is how to appropriately light you know give light to something you know but not take it away <laughs> mm -hmm. so i don't know Ooh, that's better just take away all world light where's my light that light. There's there we that go. Light. That's strange. Uh, oh. That makes sense. Hmm. I always forget. Hmm. OK, 
Just what I like deleting things on one layer <laughs> or uh, I was the weird thing about thinking and uh, or forgetting about animation but I deleted things on one layer and then I couldn't see them on other other layers but that's because at that point of time nothing is visible <laughs> just like so chronologically yes everything's invisible there we go Um, let's see, maybe if I make this light darker. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how they do it. It's like I have I either have too much light. I don't have enough light. Maybe I could close off the end of the box. No, I can't because I'm using an array. <laughs> I could apply Bring it down to, ah, like 13, could apply that. So let's see if, hmm, <laughs> Um, so if I make everything like dark gray, but I make the end of the hall white, let's see what that looks like. So I select the end of the hall and I assign it to my white material. Let's make it emit, shall we? And then, uh, that looks kind of dumb, actually. <laughs> kind of sad that I did that now. Well, I don't know. So, in the use of like ghosts in D and D or D and D like things, do you care for them? Would you like them? Would yeah. you use them in here? They're harder to use. Ooh, that looks kind of creepy. Why do you think so? <laughs> Just the creepy eyes at the end of the corner. Well, I mean, you can still you can see some wispiness, but I don't. I don't. I can't get the. I can't get. I can't get this. If like I can't can't <laughs> where's my blight um they're just harder to use in the sense of like um like they there's there's a potential for them to have so much more agency i guess um you know, because like, they're they're this thing that died, and so they they retain some of their memories, but otherwise, you know, canonically they've kind of been driven mad by the monotony and the 
timelessness that is the undead area you know the undead nature um <laughs> but also like you've got your you've got the lesser ghosts which can only really like touch people and like make their health total go down but then you've got the real ghosts that can actually like possess people those ones are a lot more fun to use but they're also a higher challenge rating so the thing that's frustrating to me is that the characters resistances kind of go up exponentially depending on what class they're playing like my monk has always been a good possession target because i never level charisma um that's funny because they actually have defenses at other times to just stop like mind control effects right but possession is yeah, not a mind a high... yeah but possession's different and that's why that's why I, I I stat my monk the way I do, so that in the event that someone you does use a ghost, then it's like the DM gets to have some fun because I'm the only one on in the group that's like an easy possess target. Um, mm. But it's like, you know, it, paladins and cleric. You know, there's always a paladin or at least a cleric, uh, definitely a cleric in the in, in the party, and so it's just like in, it's like oh you possessed. Okay, well we can just get rid of you know we could just use a spell and get rid of everything or i can use my um divine i forget what it's called um but i can you know push them out of that person you know so it's like an easy sort of thing and i feel like you could have so much more like ghostbusters-esque type fun with a ghost if you specifically tailored your player party to be these classes and these classes only <laughs> Hmm. Um, otherwise I feel like the way that ghosts are used are just like NPC fodder in which like I was saying they could have so much more like narrative agency for like giving um, yeah, whatever um, giving players information you know or like leading them somewhere but um, that's not usually how they're written. So, like, in Curse of Strahd, you know, there's just, like, they're just kind of, like, defenders, guardians of this area, you know? And that's kind of... Mm. That's not that's not as fun. <laughs> hmm. Okay. I feel like... I don't know. We probably get a lot of people that would say that, like, that's how they use them in their campaign. That, like, nobody ever fights ghosts. Uh, <laughs> but it's also... I don't know, kind of their choice. It's not that they couldn't fight ghosts because they make it so easy <laughs> to do so. Uh, just given their stats or things. Or they make it impossibly uh, impossible to do so just given stats and things. So, I don't know. I think it is this weird sort of thingamajig. Boop, boop, boop. And like recently, and like looking at the Legend of the Five Rings stuff, um, I don't remember if ghosts were all that much more difficult to fight, um, but they are, they put so many more like mechanical effects uh, for things like uh, you just being stressed out by such uh, by scenarios like that, uh, as well as like you you losing honor or glory or a variety of other things by denying requests from the spirit world or treating the spirits poorly. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's kind of a cool thing. Whereas like in D and D, like e it's it's very much up to the players and how they want to do that. Um, and I guess it is up to the players to choose a game like. Uh, um, Legend of the Five Rings as their setting, so they they can have mechanical effects or the kind of things that they're doing. But it's very much a choice. Where'd my thing go? Oh, okay. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five.
see, how long is this? 16 seconds. like it's like Adobe just skips the keyframe portion and just like forces you to tween <laughs> that's what it that's, that's what it looks like to me kind of they have uh tweening and keyframing as like specific things but um but I, I come from a traditional background of animation for the most part, so I just want to draw them like pieces of paper. <laughs> there we go. Let's see what this looks like. But also on the on the monitor that I have Discord on, the resolution's not the best. So I can't see mm. the um, I can't see the units. That is the top the the top x axis of what you've got. So it's, it's like so it's like I just assume that it's just like a large. It's like a long. <laughs> it's a long process. So that's why it, it looks like tweening more than like a keyframe page <laughs> hmm i don't know you've used different animation tools than i used i don't where did all those go um <laughs> that makes sense when you have things hidden uh like a lot of these like terms are somewhat universal in the industry but at the same time um, with the change of the tools, they kind of have that same value of, uh, it can be confusing because they want to use the same terms, except they just move them around to different places. I was like, uh, yes, I know what a keep frame is. <laughs> kind of. That wasn't too bad of a fall. Kind of happy with that. The walk was terrible. <laughs> All right, now this thing, that's too much. <laughs> do, 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 do. Audio went wonky. I gotta reset my. Hmm. Uh, the crackling. Ooh, that might be better. Curse you, lighting. Curse you, hallway. Curse you, perspective. Bullshit. Okay, I'm just going to delete this hallway. I'm tired of it. Don't understand how hallways work. <laughs> or at least that type of hallway. <laughs> Oops. So what creature is next on the agenda? After the ellip, 
it is Um, technically, the Allosaurus. Oh, dinosaurs. <laughs> so is that where we're going to go with this? If we want to stick to things that haven't existed <laughs> in some form or, or manner, we can go with the Al Mirage. Oh, just the unicorn bunny. Unicorn bunny. <laughs> that that's we could do. A... That's not it. Oh, that's right. There we go. I don't know. I'm down for not drawing dinosaurs unless you really want to. Because mm. we can? I don't know. I like, though, personally, like, my favorite kind of dinosaur is I love it when people do the dinosaurs with feathers. But <laughs> I know that's kind of your nightmare doing things with, like, too many textures. Well, if I get, yeah, I mean, I could, I could do it it's just i get distracted like during from monday through friday it's really easy to distract me from doing stuff geared towards this day mm -hmm. so i end up doing it like the hour or two before actually doing anything but yeah i was um i was reminded of a relatively simple way to do like a feather and then apply that as a mesh or as a mm. thing so it's possible god dang it i don't understand blender i don't understand like and there's no one that wants to tell me what what does this but it's like if i look at it here i can see all the way into I, you know i can see all the way into infinity but when i take you know but when i go into the camera mode it just cuts it off there's no maybe it's the world if the world color doesn't change then that means it's the uh, it's kind of the world hmm. but it's like you can see you can see the light getting cut off as if there's a wall there and it's not there isn't a wall there and the light doesn't go all the way down the hallway so it should still like taper and round off, but it doesn't. So I don't know why suddenly this invisible wall at the end of the hallway zooms up to right behind my figure. Like maybe it's my camera placement. I doubt it. I don't know. Hmm. Where's my focal length? Maybe I can do my, maybe I can increase the, nope, that's not what I want. Panoramic? No, I don't think so. Whatever. Oh no. 60 frames per second. Look at him wiggle and dance. There we go. Not quite black, but not quite gray. That's much better, I think. It's coming to impart secrets upon you. <laughs> it looks like, it looks like a, like a, like, like a like a 12 year old's 
like hurried rendition of like a dog or something is what your brush shape looks like. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird what like, I don't know, combinations of strange shapes make a pleasing brush for people. Like this one, I, I don't know why I like it. It just, it works for me. Hello. The thing at the end of the hallway. You know what else? You know what else I could do if I had more time was I could put like a different model or like a um like a depiction of uh the the pose doll, the the artistic pose doll and just shade that thing black and then just put it inside of this hair craziness so that there is an actual like shape underneath all of the tendrils mm. that could also be pretty creepy <sighs> the sad thing is i'd probably do the same sort of rendition for most other ghosts as well <laughs> Like I'd probably the only the only way I'd probably do a different rendition of like an undead spectral creature is if um, the game like let's assume I'm working for you know a game company or something like if they had it in their programming that the that the player could acquire like true sight or something you know then it's kind of like oh you never played Pokemon proper. Did you? Pokemon proper. I don't remember that version, no. <laughs> well, I mean, how far in red and blue did you ever get? I played red. Uh, I played all the way up till uh, Ruby, Sapphire, Emerald. Okay, no. I played lots of Pokemon. <clears throat> okay. In the, I don't know when they stopped depicting this, but like, so when you go into the, uh, I think it's Indigo City? No, Fuchsia? No, Fuchsia was with, what's his face? So it's Indigo. Um, when you go into like the Tower of the, un, of the, of, you know, the Tower of Pokemon Graveyards, the first time you meet the, the, the ghost of Marowak, it's just this it's just this different sprite you know it's just this kind of oh, yeah, cloud yeah, yeah. <laughs> sort of character and then when you go and get the scope the slift scope then you can go back and you actually see it for the marowak that it is and so that's kind of what i would imagine like the care you know what the programming would be is like the you know they acquire this thing and suddenly this wispy character is no you know suddenly they can realize that the this wispy character that they thought was a ghost is actually a white you know or something uh, you know or something mm -hmm. so it's like until they acquire that ability or that item all of these undead spectral things kind of look the same and then once they have it now they can identify it and now they know why their swords aren't working on it or why it's you know not trying to possess them <laughs> type of us you know. okay <laughs> which i think that would be pretty cool for a D, D concept is if you're unable to identify and it would give more um reason to take things to take those abilities like um true sight or there there was a there was a there was a lesser there was a less high spell that you could get that lets you see the ethereal plane but it was like only the ethereal plane it wasn't like like god what was that <clears throat> anyways um but it would give you more reason to take those like those weaker spells that were just kind of utility you know or just like we keep slashing at this we keep slashing at this cloud but it's not you know it's not taking damage like a ghost like what what are we you know what are we hitting and it's like oh you're not attacking a ghost you're actually attacking you know a wisp or something you're attacking a white 
You're mm. attacking a wraith. You're attacking a shadow. Uh, fifth edition is nerfed in a way to make it fun for players, <laughs> as opposed to like uh, really frustrating. Like I can't do anything without years and years and years of research. Because <laughs> um, even, well, I mean. Everyone, uh, most things have resistance to damage, which isn't even all that significant. Like, or things that should be like, you just can't hurt that at all. What? Why? Why try? It's like, I don't know. I always thought it was kind of like a one thing that I found stupid was that ev like somehow magical weapons hurt everything, uh, and that just seemed like such a cheap cop out that like. This is such an easy thing for anybody that makes something magical to be able to hurt something, mm -hmm. as opposed to like you having to get a ghost or an ethereal killing weapon. That's a specific thing. That seems like somebody's job and research to find out, you know, what bugs ghosts. But the, no, they're just like, mm, as long as it has some sort of magic, any magic, any magic at all that bypasses all their ref uh, defenses like so yeah so that would be so that would be the cutting point right so by that time usually whenever anyone encounters a ghost they usually have a magic item or three you know mm -hmm. so even if so in my scenario even if they didn't have the ability or the item that let them see the actual ident you know the actual creature you know the actual entity that they were fighting you know, they could still swipe at this at this ethereal mass and still be doing damage to it if they have like a, you know, a plus one rapier or like, you know, fire brand or something like that. You know, then it wouldn't really matter to them unless they really needed to identify like, all right, we need to kill every other thing in here except for the wisp. <laughs> you know, all the ghosts need yeah. to die because they're annoying, but we need to say, you know, we need to preserve the wisp. So that would be a reason for them to go get it then. But unless they really cared, like if they only had one character that had a magic item and everyone else only did half damage to it because they all have mundane items, then maybe they want to go get that item. But otherwise, maybe they can just tough it out and just overwhelm it with half damages. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. But I think, I don't know, they put so many creatures in that have resistance to, like, everything, anything. Like, sometimes I miss very in-depth things uh, in a video game sense to say, like, they're weak to this, they have half damage to this, they have, like, immunity to this without having to get too crazy. Like, even still, like, it's pointless to, eat, to mention, like, the piercing, bludgeoning, slashing, whereas in previous games, like, it was stupid to go against zombies with like a bludgeoning weapon pointless like not pointless it was just why would you want to do it when you knew when once you learned that slashing really does stuff to it or you wouldn't similarly you wouldn't do anything to skeletons and that was really early on that you learned that certain creatures have like you should come at it with some tactics <laughs> do 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 Ah, Pixie. I also remember most of all the weapons and what damages they do and their subtype things. You know, it is kind of weird that the the dev team didn't just for you know for those blanket resist you know for those blanket resistance creatures just um, write in like you know resistance to non magical weapons because <laughs> there is a redundancy that I remember them writing in that mm -hmm. usually happens in which for like 16 monsters they have to write resistance to to bludgeoning slashing piercing damage um and all you know and, and that aren't non-magical or something you know it's like this long phrase when all they have to do mm -hmm. is Unless if it's non -magical like magical, yeah, weapons. unless non magical weapons, and then you know the assumption carries over that oh okay, so then if it's magical, then that that trumps that. So cool. Yep. Nope. Very silly. 
There is a dude who I can't remember what is. He does a bunch of these um, animated spell book things, though, and I love them because they're funny. But he also has this one um, episode in which he proposes how you could bring elements of The Witcher into your D&D game. And it was it wasn't really things like, you know, how can you give more um, more like narrative flair to it? But it was like, how can you change the stats of your monsters so that your characters actually have to do a little bit of research and then go into the fight with, you know, with your, you know, with the prepared um, oil on your on your sword or, you know, the right the right kind of um cloth wrapping on your hand to prevent its you know its poison from seeping into you you know that kind of thing so it's like mm. you know you actually have to you know go around the town and actually ask them like hey so what is this monster in the woods that keeps you know bothering your farmers and stuff like that and i loved it so much because he was he, he even he even went into describe about um um, how you can mess with their resistances and stuff so that it's not just this blanket sort of resistance sort of thing. It's, you know, it's very specific. So you bring in that, that feeling of, oh, it's a skeleton. So I have to, I have to smack it with a club to do more damage, you know, or it's a, it's a zombie. So I have to try to, you know, I have to try to disable it so I can get in a, a better surgical hit on it. Hmm. You have to show me what that is, or link that to me sometime. Let's see how long are you? Little moment. Point three. Okay. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, interesting. Bum bum bum. Bing bam. Bum bum bum. Um, this is. I have no idea how to say his last name, but his name is Z Bashu. I will put a link in the Discord, and when I actually see people in chat, I may or may not link it there. Um, I'll stick it in tables. Cool. Thank you. Crazy stuff. Funny, I'm not gonna like get to the Aleph section all that quickly. We'll see how it goes since it is kind of like more swirly mass things, but it's kind of fun just doing peoples. <laughs> You're kind of there. You've got about 19 more minutes to try to get to like a concrete animation landing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That's not going to happen. Well, I mean, you've 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 already reached like two other concrete landings. You just need to reach one more concrete landing and then we could probably call it an episode. It's weird, like, I don't know. Uh, I try out and try to move stuff, and it's like having these headphones in and not trying to leave the computer and the conversation and things while, like, testing out movements in my squeaky chair. <laughs> it's a little bit, a little bit odd. Gotta, gotta admit. 
Damn it, I really wish that your camera worked, because that would be hilarious to <laughs> see. Watch me just make strange faces and wiggle my body around. While I'm trying to imagine, what does convulsing look like? <laughs> <clears throat> um let's see what other Swamp. Weird. <laughs> That's weird. The ellipse environments are tagged as swamp and urban. Swamps? <laughs> Who's finding out so many secrets inside of swamps? I don't know. It might be a it might be a hag thing. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> There's just an excessive amount of hags putting curses on stuff. I think that'd be that'd also be a really interesting thing to do where it's like kind of a rescue mission, you know, the hags take this NPC that you know, from the players and they have to try to rescue this guy before they, you know, fully tie him down and finish this ritual and then like force him to read this like you know, this like stone tablet or something. Maybe strange oh that would also be a really cool um flavor text for like a swamp witch or something you know it's like instead of having a spell book she just keeps a bunch of ellipse in lanterns and or something you know ellipse in a lantern so all of her all of her curses and all of her you know all of her crazy spells are just these trapped people basically <laughs> That could be a good, good warlock thing. Strange spell book. <laughs> That'd be the weird ghost yeah. version of like a mind flare. You know, it's like you you're this warlock and you serve this. You know, you serve this this great. You know, this larger, darker entity. And what the larger, darker entity doesn't tell you is that you go through your warlock. You know, all of your warlock life thing up to this one apex point at which you're given the choice to either betray your your dark master and i guess die or you take the next step and become an ellip and join the quote-unquote spell book <laughs> hmm. that, i want this one there we go creepy God. Except, I don't know. The, I mean, the sense of the ellipse is that you're just stuck in eternal pain and you just really want to tell somebody about how bad it feels. <laughs> how to do? Where's that thing? Do, 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 yeah, do. well, I mean, you know, the Dark Lord doesn't tell the warlock that. <laughs> it's just you become a part of the greater collective. <laughs> There's a secret. That sucks. Like it could it could also be a crazy thing where 
a hag or something tricks tricks a player into thinking that they hold a tomb of um what's it called tomb of fitness or something or a tomb you know one of those tomes that if you spend you know x amount of days reading it then you your your stat goes up by one or something but in reality what in reality what they hold is a tome in which like the first the first sentence or the last the first or the last sentence of each chapter holds like a portion of the secret like of the you know of the of the of the of this great dark secret and if they finish the you know if they finish the tome you know the very last sentence is the is the final you know is the final portion of the secret and they turn into an ellip <laughs> It's not too bad. Not too bad. But it's like, how would you, how would you, how would you as the DM put that in there and have it be fair to the player that's trying to read this thing? You know, it's like all the other players are trying to find clues or you drop hints to all the other players that the book that they're reading is not actually a good book. <laughs> and then you have to hope that <laughs> they... Book. You have to hope that they come to the conclusion fast, or not fast, but within the time limit, and try to stop that player from reading that book. I guess that could be I mean, fair, because there's multiple layers to that. So there's the first layer in the sense that they have to have been tricked by this evil character to assume that this book is something beneficial. Then they have to choose to actually read the book and then there's the layer of their friends trying to find out, you know, trying to piece together the, the hints of like, oh, that book is actually really bad. You shouldn't read that. <laughs> there's got to be a better way to do these things. But I'm doing it. <laughs> So what do you have so far? Uh, are you able to body's just, wiggling. Are you able to just press play oh. and see what you got so far? What is that? How did that happen? Uh, yeah. There we go. Let's play this. Let's see. From the beginning. Oh. Walking in, kind of. Fall. Jump back. Nice. <laughs> All right. Insert picture. Or, but... Insert picture card of the other, <laughs> of the other um story <laughs> storyboard, image still images. Sadly, so I'm like trying to work with like super small increments of things. Um, but I am, I can't think of right now how to uh, orient things so that they, um, when I paste them, create a new layer that it's making, putting it into the place that I want it to be. Uh, the issue with that, oh. Is that having to zoom in and out of like the timeline, just acting a little bit funny because I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's slower. I know there's got to be a quicker way, quicker button, and it's just my own ignorance. But that is me. Well, that's why. Like when I started up my my Blender project, I was reminded how much, like why I started, why I wanted to start this project is because it's like with each, you know, with each creature, you know, they each kind of um, demand like a different sort of angle or a different sort of technique for, you know, for their p portrayal. And so it really kind of forces you to use those other, you know, those other functions of the programs and the tools that you use. 
So like, you know, yesterday I was doing, or the last time I was doing sculpting, and this time I was doing, you know, simulation and particle, you know, simulation and particle simulation, lighting. True, true, true. And today you're doing animation where before you were doing stills and shading. <laughs> The weird places Dungeons and Dragons take us. <laughs> Let's watch this weird guy wiggle. <laughs> it's a terrible walk cycle. Moderately decent falling to the floor. How <laughs> to get up there? Yeah. <laughs> it's like. Okay. I know what I did. But right. that's. Neat. It's like the inner, the inner ghost, the inner ghost dude, like, is spiking him up for a, for a, like a layup or something, like a basketball. <laughs> you know, that could work if you just move his, if you just move his calves and his feet, you know, if you just rotate those, like, 30 degrees. That's true. <laughs> but unfortunately now I have to go to each one of those frames uh, those layers and do the same thing uh... Uh, it isn't terrible but it is let's see it is some um, to do right. whichever one whichever one's relatively more time efficient <laughs> It might be more time efficient just to not have him rise up. Rise up. It might be. <laughs> Honestly, oh, I don't. Man. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, which frame does it freak out on? You guys. I don't know why, but it's always nice to kind of see the releases of large studios like Disney or um, DreamWorks and stuff where you actually see like the portions of animation that are finished and then they have the rough, you know, and then they have portions of rough animation and then those sections where they haven't like started yet and it's still just like the still, it's like 15 seconds of just the still image of the storyboard but they have the voiceover mm -hmm. for all of it. I really like those. Um, those Whenever they release those videos, those are really nice to watch every once in a while because you just like look at those and you're just like, man, the storyboard, like the character design and the storyboard looks so much different than like the, their finished product. Well, not so different, but... Mm -hmm. And we had a conversation about this once, uh, about how... It's very easy to get caught up in the idea that you create finished pieces instead of like fragments of stuff, and then somebody else creates a fin like finishes those other parts. Oh, it's still that guy just floats around. <laughs> see, but see, I think that would look. I think that would look pretty cool. I don't, you know, I don't I know. If, I don't know if you have the 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 patience for it, but it look. All you have to do is rotate the the calves and the feet a little bit. And then it's like he's being lifted up and then he's being thrown down, you know, like his yeah. body's being discarded. <laughs> it is kind of cool. I just think the hard thing is, is that I need a, I need a quick tween in between those to give like a section of it floating up into that position. So I know where to place every, <laughs> each and every one of those layers is not... Very fun. But yeah, going back to what you were, you know, what you were alluding to before, you know, that that's still that's still a, a a question in my head over like when you're, you know, when you're in school, when, you, when you're in school for art, you know, does that ever cross anyone's mind of like my goal, my goal here in college is to be a storyboard artist, like. You know how how much detail do I really need to go into? Like, 
I'm sure it falls into that category of like, well, it's better to have those skills than to just never develop them. But if you know that you've got, you know, if you know that you've got a storyboard life ahead of you, then it's like how 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 irritating are some of your courses, you know, when they demand all of these like details from you. And you're just like, I I just need to know shapes and how to massively produce images <laughs> it's one of those things that technically you need it's good to have an understanding of a lot of different fields and a lot of things build your general skill and hopefully you're you're seeing it like a funnel where at every new layer you're getting to you're getting just a little bit deeper and a little bit closer to what you want to be doing hmm. um but and not that like just shapes it is an easy fundamental thing that by the time you get to your pinnacle of your funnel where you're working and focusing just shapes you are a master at how to emote just shapes and you know how to do those really quickly to show just and only what you want yeah like i still need uh, a lot of practice with like emotion and stuff so like even for my for my version of this of the specter it's like sure i can give them eyes that glow in the dark but like how do i portray that they're like wrathful you know wrathful ragey eyes mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, beyond mm -hmm. beyond just the color wrathful ragey or vengeful and so that's that's i don't know i think that education proper response uh where they're hoping that like while you're while you're learning and while you advance you're you're learning superficially angry eyes are red but then as in, in the next level you're like okay what my focus is is on realism so angry eyes are red that's true keep the red but you also need to know these things to make it look real and then as you go forward i'm like okay so you're trying to make realistic ones that uh, that uh like your focus is you know uh animating fully how things are supposed to look and then you're like oh, okay 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 i know where it's how it's supposed to be okay so this guy i want do i want your body that's an interesting sentence <laughs> i like it but i don't know there is that that thing that you're being cheated and you're you've wasted so much time learning so many different things where maybe maybe if you could just focus on shapes i don't know an interesting argument <laughs> i mean this you know the this um this question this reoccurring question in my head always comes up because um and it actually stemmed from math <laughs> um oh, you know one. in your in your occupation how much math do you actually use and um i asked my I asked my mom who was in the medical profession for a long time and even she was just like well you know i didn't you know yeah it's not really a lot like you just kind of you know you just read a meter or you just kind of you know you don't ever really like, I mean, she was, she was never a surgeon. <laughs> Let me just put that out there. But, um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that are already kind of pre calculated for you, I guess, or, or even if when she did have to do math. So like if she had to make a, um, like a volume count or something, you know, then she would have to go Back in her day, she'd have to go back to the office and get out a pad of paper and actually do the calculations. Um, <laughs> you know, go back to the office where the calculator existed. Because um, she was saying that um, the only time when mathematics weighed heavily on her job was when she transferred over to pediatrics. And, you know, because then you had to do a bunch of things like, all right, so what is the you know what are the what are the safe ratios what are the you know what are the nutritional values that i have to recommend you know to all these you know different scenarios blah 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 and 
while we were having that conversation, I posed that also I would imagine that like anesthe you know, anesthesiologists would also need to have a heavy <laughs> have a heavy understanding of math also because they have to do you know they have to calculate the dosage that they're doing against the patient's you know body weight, um, metabolism, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. But I was relating that to when I was in the coffee shop. And I was like, you know, I don't, I don't think there was ever a time in which we grabbed the carton of milk and the pitcher and we said, all right, we need 30 milliliters. And we start, you know, we poured it out and we tried to get to, you know, we tried to get to that, you know, whatever the amount was at the time. And it was just, you know, we, we just eyeball it, you know, it was like, all right, so there's this point on the pitcher and we're trying to, that's the target on the pitcher, you know, but that's also a time thing. You know, we don't have the time to sit there and like accurately measure out the exact amount of volume every single time. And so it was like in, you know, it's odd though. Cause in blender, there are functions in blender that kind of force you to use like basic functions of math in the hmm. sense of like, um, you know, how, how, how much do you want this to react to this, you know, to this feature and then, you know, percentages, percentages on that. Um, there is one portion that I try to avoid because, um, I, I, I just never have needed that function yet, but also because it uses sine and cosine. <laughs> and that really that really that scared me back when i was learning it and it scares me now so i was just like ah, i'll just leave it alone <laughs> um but the day that i actually do have a project that needs to use that function is the day that i'll sit there and teach it to myself <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, it, it's kind of strange, but you never know exactly where you're going to need your math. It's given the most of the research that says that it's easier to learn things when you're younger. It's probably a bad idea to like say like, I'll just learn it when I get there because when you get there it might be very late and much more difficult for you. And sometimes it's easier to re review learn things yeah my 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 work ethics or my my learning ethics as far as blender goes is that if i haven't needed to use it yet for any of my projects um i probably don't need to be like extremely intimate with that funk with that function but if i need to if i need to use it for like one project that i'm working on for one week then you know, it's probably not that bad to just watch someone else, you know, use that function on YouTube or something and just apply what I need to what they did and then just let it go from there. Because that's probably one of those instances where it's like if I was in a team, I'd probably give it, you know, I'd probably hand the project over to someone else for that function and then they'd give it either back to me or to the next person in the pipeline. Maybe it's hard to know it's hard to know where you are going to be in the pipeline also so whenever someone whenever i overhear someone say you know oh yeah you know i'm gonna i'm gonna go into animation when i'm done with school it's like all right what process of animation <laughs> That's funny. My, I have like a, a wireless mouse, and when it starts to run out of batteries, it gets very fussy. <laughs> uh, that every time I accidentally nudge it the wrong way, it wants to, like, disconnect. Isn't too bad. Let's see. What are your maths? Nineteen. It's not too bad. 
Yeah, I think the most okay. math that I end up having to use is be like, all right, 60 frames per second, and how many frames do I have? <laughs> Yes, so that's on. Then I think the most ironic thing, just to kind of continue the the math the math rant, that I guess that's technically what I'm doing, is um. The, the most ironic thing is that um, my dad, who holds the most technological-based job in our family, um, it doesn't look like he uses any math at all, Like, because most of it's, you know, it's program language, so it's a lot of... It's a, it's a, lo it's a lot of, like, strings, you know, strings of words and stuff like that. I, I can't imagine where math would come into that unless he decided to use binary, which I still don't fully understand how that works, if that is actually a form of math at all. <laughs> but... I don't know. We sound like two dummies right now, I think. <laughs> Good. But I don't know how intelligent we sounded when we were talking about nerd ghost things and story writing. <laughs> uh, hey deselect. You don't need no math to write subject, predicate, rising action, conclusion. <laughs> hey man, like dango, all I know is I take this dango club, man, and then like dango smash, man, right on crocodile head. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm asking you to do a lot of things, computer. Just relax and let me do it. There we go. Let's see. Do, 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 do. There's a portion of that where it looks like there's a moonwalk. <laughs> 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 that was awkward but i uh, will let it be let's get one final frame with like a like a solid depiction of your lip and no then, there's uh, not gonna be a solid depiction of it <laughs> well some sort of depiction just finish it off with the final frame of a lip Let's see. Then Where... we'll call it there. Where are we? Oh, so much. How? Oh, yeah, I guess so. That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> Do, 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 do. A dumb name. Rather like trying to find where does it start happening? Oh no! <laughs> it's weird. I love using the tablet and stylus, uh, but like for like precision, just clicking around the, the screen and stuff, the mouse I find very easy. So I just switch back and forth between my tab, uh, the stylus and the, uh, the mouse to get around. <laughs> so I'm kind of sad that my mouse is dying in this section because it's harder for me to like just click on little things like this layer, move this part to the here. Like mm -hmm. super easy for drawing, but. <laughs> Smash them on the floor. Okay, so I guess that's where it starts.
Where is that layer? What is that layer? Ah. Good. That's going to be interesting. Power two zoomed in. I don't know. You've given me a lot to play around with today. So you should be proud on that, <laughs> even though you're not going to probably get any good lip drawings. <laughs> I'll just use mine. <laughs> I'll use my creation as the thumbnail. Which that's the other thing I've been distracted from is taking these and uploading them. <laughs> there is a lot of functions on here that I don't use, or I, I know exist, but I don't remember exactly where things are. Yeah, hopefully that works. Did your background get more saturated? Yes, it did, because I enabled the onion skins layering. That's, so it's showing uh, uh, multiplied versions of the things that are happening before and after. And since the background is the same, the background is just looking darker because it's showing multiples of the, that doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's just the sun's coming in. And so I don't know if it's my eyes freaking out or if it's actually happening or not. Mm -hmm. Are poltergeists always malicious? Uh, I don't know. I think it comes down to that idea of like, um, ghosts. Uh, if a ghost is made, it's because it's like that's too much uh, emotions, and they, those emotions start driving it to be angry, but and to want to lash out. And if it didn't want to lash out, it would have just moved on, right? That sounds like I think that's a ghost. Ghost logic. I think a ghost could linger just to occupy. Like it really liked being at the mall. So it just exists at the mall and other people are free are kind of weirded out by it. And, you know, could be so on... like in, in that case, if you don't think that it's just an emotional attachment that uh, that is a negative one that doesn't have like a heaven idea, then sure. Why not? You could have. But then it's like the should we di should we create a whole bunch of different kind of NPCs for all the different kind of things that you should do in D&D &D, or that you could do? Or are we just going to call those commoners like <laughs> commoners? what i mean you've got humanoids you've got beasts and you've got commoners <laughs> it's too much who cares who cares what they do or what they want to uh want to be called they are boring and not heroes oh man that is it's too much Oh. <laughs> what about this the wrong way? Uh, oh, maybe not. If it's easier. Could um you could just go to the whatever quote unquote final frame is on there and just have the a lip like you know fully materialized and then it's just like an assumed creature that he's like doing and then just pop and then we can just see how it you know how it 
ends. <laughs> Boring. <laughs> well, mostly just because it is like that doesn't. I don't know. I wasn't in since all of this is bad drawings, and I wasn't intending to draw a good drawing. I don't think I have anything in my head. That's what I mean. I guess. Uh, okay. That it means nothing. So. I guess it doesn't matter if I onion skin it. But... So for me, I guess I don't really care for eyes, but mouths. Mouths seem more important on the creating of an ellipse. Um, uh, same about like head like things that it wouldn't necessarily need any of that. Um, your, your... Any of that because it just... Sorry, your, Sorry. your ellip was um, was created by a, by a secret it was told. My ellip was created by a secret it read. I guess so, but if we're thinking... I don't know. My idea is that for it to cause damage and stuff, it does the psychic... Like spreading of things and it has this like psychic or it does this like babbling where it moans and cries and tells its secrets mm. so it would, i don't know i guess it, i don't know there's a fantasy weird things so it doesn't necessarily need any actual mouths non-mouth units to to do things but i think visually that is what i would go for like a spectral gibbering mouther. Yeah. I don't remember where I saw it, but there was a creature that your your darker your like the darkest shadings remind me of, in which um, it was really cool because it was just a very simple concept, but it portrayed a lot of detail in my eyes, in the sense that it was just this dark it was just this dark patch in this like amorphous form, and then it was almost basically just like white rectangles, just like um, placed uh spaced out like along the thing so it made kind of this like mouth you know just these like just these like floating teeth in this black amorphous space and you, you, there's just this like even darker darkness that was the inside of this um creature's mouth and mm -hmm. just like and then those would just be like those mouths would just be splotched all over this creature it's kind of where i was thinking I wanted this to to get at like nasty little teeth things. I see that creature before. Uh, Seems so familiar. I forgot what he called himself, but it was one of the people. Uh, do you think it was the thing from uh, the Sandman comics? 
there oh, was a... yeah that is what that's that is where that memory's from that's exactly where that memory is from yeah what the hell what the hell was that thing <laughs> I also don't remember what his concept was. Was he was he a world in and of himself that was just like floating around as as an entity? <laughs> no, that was a different one. But I guess it could be. Because um, I thought he like stole he stole someone from him. He was like, "Are you gonna Are you gonna come inside me and like try to get her? And you'll be lost within me." <laughs> If you do, and he's like, all right, I mean, sure. I want to say. I don't know. It's one of those things that, like, every, all those entities are uh, so powerful <laughs> that they could very easily be places and things and shape shift into other things since they're just ideas of being nightmares. <laughs> Then I guess the way that I see this creature is that, I don't know, literal, uh, literally, it would feel like paper or um, uh, being burnt up and torn into pieces uh, that are wisp-like. But I don't know if, I don't know, that's just the kind of manifestation of how it looks, even if it is like more or less incorporeal. It's like a library version of Sharknado. Yeah. <laughs> Full of terrible knowledge. And oh, you don't know what sharks are thinking. They do. Eat, 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 eat. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. <laughs> so I feel like you would see like pieces and portions of things that are actually body parts. I feel like equally, maybe you could feel it would just be, I don't know. I wonder if it would be interesting if they had like pieces of text and stuff written of like those secrets and ideas and just like jumbled up thoughts that this thing creature used to have. Just keep rambling on about it's like, its memories of life and then only when asked does it give you the fraction of the secret that turned it into what it was or what it is now <laughs> that'd be crazy that'd be a cool flavor text too if only one mouth imparted one fragment no one mouth says the same thing <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I want to change you a little thing. That's what I got. Nice. Now press play and let's be... see him sporadically pop into existence. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so sad. Do, do, do. Terrible little walk. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I love it. I hate it. <laughs> 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 all righty and that is going to be our time for today uh thank you for tuning in and if you want to watch us live join us on sundays and or possibly saturdays we'll update as it gets updated um at around two o'clock usually on mm -hmm. twitch.tv slash foxstar f-o-x-t-a-r-r -R underscore uh thank you and we hope to see you in a later episode bye <laughs>
Also, if you have any renditions of an ellip, please feel free to send it over to um, on Twitter at Foxstar underscore or to even at Evenstar Long, I think, mm. right? Yes. On Instagram. On uh, Instagram. All right. Laters. Goodbye. Mer. Mm. We now return.